Good morning, everyone. And uh, for those of you, uh, there's a lot of you, probably afternoon, evening, maybe even the middle of the night for you, wherever you are, welcome. If you're here in the, uh, the, east, the west coast here and you're settling in your coffee, like me, out of my LCHF mug that I got from our Korean friends that came to our very first event, um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of motivation, something that I came across a few years ago, and it has been incredibly inspirational for me. And so I've been wanting to incorporate this into my opening for the longest time, but I've never been able to find a way, and this format has, has given me an opportunity to do that. Um, some of you may have actually seen it, and I really encourage you to um, listen to it again. I've listened to it many, many times, and find that every time it, uh, it reinforces that inspiration. And I always seem to come away with um, some kind of nugget, some, some little bit that I never got from it before. Um, it's an amazing speech, and the fact that it's able to do that and always provide something for you every time you listen to it. So please settle down and, and listen to this, and I'll be back with you um, once it's over. It is indeed an honor for me to be here tonight. It's been almost 37 years to the day that I graduated from UT. I remember a lot of things about that day. I remember I had a throbbing headache from a party the night before. I remember I had a serious girlfriend who I later married. That's important to remember, by the way. And I remember I was getting commissioned in the Navy that day. But of all the things I remember, I don't have a clue who the commencement speaker was, and I certainly don't remember anything they said. So acknowledging that fact, if I can't make this commencement speech memorable, I will at least try to make it short. So the university's slogan is, what starts here changes the world. Well, I've got to admit, I kind of like it. What starts here changes the world. Tonight, there are almost 8 thousand students, or there are more than 8,000 students, graduated from UT. So that great paragon of analytical rigor, ask.com, says that the average American will meet 10,000 people in their lifetime. 10,000 people, that's a lot of folks. But if every one of you changed the lives of just 10 people, and each one of those people changed the lives of another 10 people, and another 10, then in five generations, 125 years, the class of 2014 will have changed the lives of 800 million people. 800 million people. Think about it. Over twice the population of the United States. Go one more generation and you can change the entire population of the world. Eight billion people. If you think it's hard to change the lives of 10 people, change their lives forever, you're wrong. I saw it happen every day in Iraq and Afghanistan. A young army officer makes a decision to go left instead of right down a road in Baghdad, and the 10 soldiers with him are saved from a close-in ambush. In Kandahar province, Afghanistan, a non-commissioned officer from the female engagement team senses that something isn't right and directs the infantry platoon away from a 500-pound IED, saving the lives of a dozen soldiers. But if you think about it, not only were those soldiers saved by the decisions of one person, but their children were saved, and their children's children. Generations were saved by one decision, one person. But changing the world can happen anywhere, and anyone can do it. So what starts here can indeed change the world. But the question is, what will the world look like after you change it? Well, I'm confident that it will look much, much better. But if you'll humor this old sailor for just a moment, I have a few suggestions that may help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served a day in uniform. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation, or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar, and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. I've been a Navy SEAL for 36 years, but it all began when I left UT for basic SEAL training in Coronado, California. 
Basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and, and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. To me, basic SEAL training was a lifetime of challenges crammed into six months. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. That seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened SEALs. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. <laughs> during SEAL training, the students, during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one coxswain to help guide the dinghy. Every day, your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to 10 feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. Everyone must exert equal effort or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the Munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The Munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. Several times a week, the instructors would line up the class and do a uniform inspection. It was exceptionally thorough. Your hat had to be perfectly starched, your uniform immaculately pressed, your belt buckle shiny and void of any smudges. 
But it seemed that no matter how much effort you put into starching your hat or pressing your uniform or polishing your belt buckle, it just wasn't good enough. The instructors would find something wrong. For failing uniform inspection, the student had to run, fully clothed, into the surf zone, then wet from head to toe, roll around on the beach until every part of your body was covered with sand. The effect was known as a sugar cookie. You stayed in the uniform the rest of the day, cold, wet, and sandy. There were many a student who just couldn't accept the fact that all their efforts were in vain, that no matter how hard they tried to get the uniform right, it went unappreciated. Those students didn't make it through training. Those students didn't understand the purpose of the drill. You were never going to succeed. You were never going to have a perfect uniform. The instructors weren't going to allow it. Sometimes, no matter how well you prepare, or how well you perform, you still end up as a sugar cookie. It's just the way life is sometimes. If you want to change the world, get over being a sugar cookie and keep moving forward. Every day during training, you were challenged with multiple physical events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics, something designed to test your mettle. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those times, those standards, your name was posted on a list, and at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. A circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that for that day, you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant that the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But at some time during SEAL training, Everyone, everyone made the circus list. But an interesting, an interesting thing happened to those who were constantly on the list. Over time, those students who did two hours of extra calisthenics got stronger and stronger. The pain of the circuses built inner strength and physical resiliency. Life is filled with circuses. You will fail. You will likely fail often. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At times, it will test you to your very core. But if you, don't, if you want to change the world, don't be afraid of the circuses. At least twice a week, the trainees were required to run the obstacle course. The obstacle course contained 25 obstacles, including a 10-foot wall, a 30-foot cargo net, a barbed wire crawl, to name a few. But the most challenging obstacle was the slide for life. It had a three-level, 30-foot tower at one end, and a one-level tower at the other. In between was a 200-foot-long rope. You had to climb the three-tiered tower, and once at the top, you grabbed the rope, swung underneath the rope, and pulled yourself hand over hand until you got to the other end. The record for the obstacle course had stood for years when my class began in 1977. The record seemed unbeatable, until one day a student decided to go down the slide for life head first. Instead of swinging his body underneath the rope and inching his way down, he bravely mounted the top of the rope and thrust himself forward. It was a dangerous move, seemingly foolish and fraught with risk. Failure could mean injury and being dropped from the course. Without hesitation, the student slid down the rope perilously fast. Instead of several minutes, it only took him half that time. And by the end of the course, he had broken the record. If you want to change the world, Sometimes you have to slide down the obstacles head first. During the land warfare phase of training, the students are flown out to San Clemente Island, which lies off the coast of San Diego. The waters off San Clemente are a breeding ground for the great white sharks. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if a shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, 
you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. As Navy SEALs, one of our jobs is to conduct underwater attacks against enemy shipping. We practice this technique ex extensively during training. The ship attack mission is where a pair of SEAL divers is dropped off outside an enemy harbor and then swims well over two miles underwater using nothing but a depth gauge and a compass to get to the target. During the entire swim, even well below the surface, there is some light that comes through. It is comforting to know that there is open water above you. But as you approach the ship, which is tied to a pier, the light begins to fade. The steel structure of the ship blocks the moonlight. It blocks the surrounding street lamps. It blocks all ambient light. To be successful in your mission, you have to swim under the ship and find the keel, the center line, and the deepest part of the ship. This is your objective. But the keel is also the darkest part of the ship, where you cannot see your hand in front of your face, where the noise from the ship's machinery is deafening, and where it gets to be easily disoriented, and you can fail. Every SEAL knows that under the keel, at that darkest moment of the mission, is a time when you need to be calm, when you must be calm, when you must be composed, when all your tactical skills, your physical power, and your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the run water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down to the Mud Flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive this freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone-chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted. And somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope. The power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start singing when you're up to your neck in mud. Finally, in SEAL training, there's a bell, a brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit, all you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to wake up at five o'clock. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to be in the freezing cold swims. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. To the class of 2014, you are moments away from graduating, moments away from beginning your journey through life, moments away from starting to change the world for the better. It will not be easy, but you are the class of 2014, the class that can affect the lives of 800 million people in the next century. Start each day with a task completed. 
Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Thank you very much. Hook 'em horns. All right, we're back. Hopefully you guys uh, got some inspiration from that like I did. I just wanted to uh, have, talk about it a little bit, how it's, how it's affected my life so much. Um, well, to start with, I don't make my bed every morning, but that's because Pam's still in it, so she probably wouldn't appreciate that so much. <laughs> but um, to find someone to help you through life, that, uh, that I've got in spades from Pam. Um, respect everyone. I'm kind of a bit intolerant sometimes, I think, and so that's something that I really have to work on. But failing often is, um, <laughs> is something that I've, I've really got used to, and it, and it really helps to, to have this motivation behind me to make sure that I, uh, that I deal with it and, and, uh, and keep going. But I think the, the biggest thing that, that always kind of resonates me is, the, is that the lesson that he talks about where um, he talks about going under the keel of the ship, and his lesson from that is that you need to step up, you need to be your very best when times are the toughest. And um, actually something like that happened yesterday. I, uh, we built this beautiful live stream page for everyone and they updated the, the editor that we use for uh, creating the page and it corrupted everything and the whole page disappeared. It just went completely blank at like lunchtime yesterday. And um, I had to sit down and think on General McRaven's words there about that you need to be calm. You must be calm. And uh, we worked through it and we found a way and we got the page back up again and, and, and you guys are none the worse for it today. Um, but it's really important to, to focus on that if, uh, if things are going to be tough because all of you are going to experience that um, experience that at some time or another. So, um, what starts here changes the world. He said he liked that. I really like it too. And so, it's running as a theme throughout this whole weekend for us, right? This is the theme of this conference. What starts here this weekend will change the world. I'm certain of it. And, um, let me see if I can get this across here. Yeah, so, Pavla was at our event in 2016, at our very first event. And in 2017, in August, she published this, on our, this comment on our website, actually on our Facebook page. And I'm going to read it to you as she wrote it so that you can hopefully hear it in, in her voice. Um, she says, hi, everyone. I'd like to share my low-carb story with you. It has been almost four years since I heard about low-carb ketogenic way of eating for the first time. I was fascinated and changed my diet right away with incredible results. I've started, I've started to study more to understand better. I am from Prague, Czech Republic, and there is only a few information about low-carb in Czech. But I wanted to share my story with, and my results with other people and motivate them to think more about their diet. That is why I became nutrition specialist in 2016. In summer 2016, I've noticed that there was going to be a low-carb conference in San Diego. Even San Diego is 10,000 miles from Prague. I knew that this was a must-see event for me. The conference was such an inspiration for me that I have started my low-carb food blog in September 2016. In January 2017, I have founded a Czech Facebook low-carb group with only a few members. And I remember that she posted this on August the 31st, 2017, which is eight months after she started this group. And she goes on to say, 
I'm very proud that I can say we are expecting to reach 10,000 members this Sunday. One member for one mile from Prague to San Diego last year. Thank you, Pam Devine and Doug Reynolds, for being such an inspiration to me. One person can change the world if she gives people hope. This is, was an incredible story for us, and it, I'm, I'm actually impressed that I held it together because I get quite emotional when I read stuff like this. It is, um, it's so inspiring for us, and I'm going to count her as one of my 10 people that I've managed to change the lives of. Um, there are so many others. I talk, uh, we did a podcast just the other day with uh, uh, Andrew Berger. He came to our event last year and was type 1 diabetic, um, kind of introducing this and finding some uh, success with it, but really wavering. And we embraced him and encouraged him and introduced him to Dr. Ben, and he started doing the... the exercises and stuff, and his story is absolutely incredible. I, I encourage you to, um, to go and check that, that podcast out and listen to it. it. It's pretty amazing. So I can count that as, as two. And um, another one I can think of is Dr. Brian Lenskis. I mean, he's going to be, he's speaking during this event. Uh, he's going to be helping me moderate a couple of the Q&As and the panel at the end on Sunday. Um, he came to 2017 where he'd been trying it on, on himself. It was looking good for him, but he, um, he was never convinced that it was, it was like something that he could take to his patients. And then he came to our event and was totally blown away. And he reached out to me a few months later and said to me, Doug, can we meet and talk about what we can do here in San Diego? And so we met up. He told me that was like five months now after the event that he had never, ever had a patient come off insulin in all his years of practice. And since he started talking to his patients after he left that event, in five months he had 11 patients that came off insulin. And he says, I didn't take them off insulin. I just encouraged them to maybe change their lifestyle and, and change what they ate. And they took themselves off insulin. And... Um, he created, uh, or he put on an event at his church, a local San Diego event, which we went and kind of supported him at. And he, got, he ran it on the Sunday and repeated it on the Monday night, each for six weeks in a row. And he had 200 people show up for every one of them. It was incredible. And then he met uh, Jason Fung and Dr. Trocolasian. And the next minute, they start Low Carb MD podcast. And... I'm pretty certain that by now they must have gone over 4 million downloads, which, which is just, I don't know, it's mind-boggling. And um, so I'm going to count Brian as, as one of the people that I've helped uh, to change his life. And so we've got seven more. I've got seven more to go. And Pam's probably got, in fact, she talks to so many people on social media all the time. I'm sure she's way over the 10 the 10 people that she needs to change. Pavla didn't get the memo about changing 10. She thought, oh yeah, we reached out to her just the other day and um, to find out how things are going and everything. And that, that uh, Facebook group is now up to 170,000 people, 170,000 people, which is just staggering. Um, so yeah, uh, one person can change the world if they give people hope. I love it. Okay, so let's see. All righty. So um, some, of, some of you who have been to some of my our later events in the last year or two would have, would have heard some of this, but I want to go over this because it's leading up to an announcement I want to make towards the end of this talk that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, when we created this, I, I felt like I really... Um, then, then we needed a place, a professional environment for all these practitioners to be able to be in, and collaborate and talk and, and everything. And so we created this concept of um, professional, um, just professional environments for, for uh, practitioners to join and be a part of. But it never really took off. It, didn't, it, 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 it just wasn't the right place for it. We created a list, as you can see here, of, of medical practitioners, which has been 
pretty useful and, and popular, but still probably not the, the ideal place for it. We had some, uh, actually you can go one further. So we introduced some, some training, so a lot of it through the nutrition network, um, and used that to kind of certify people so that we, we knew at least if they did these courses that they knew what they were talking about. And so we would be able to put this badge up next to their name in, in the practitioner list that uh, showed that uh, we basically could say that they were certified because they had, that it, we knew that they had at least done this course. Um, so then Adele Height came into my life. And um, Gary Taub's suggested that we have a talk back in 2018 or have a session where we got feedback from, from practitioners to, um, to tell us about how, how they've been progressing and how they are trying to implement this in their practice and, how, and how the difficulties that they were experiencing and, um, and maybe the, the, the successes too, hopefully. Um, and he suggested that I talk to Adele and maybe get her to moderate this, uh, this session because I know now that I know that he and, and had been talking to her a lot about this. So I contacted her and she came back and said, yeah, sure, but like, and she'd sent me this two-page document that was like a brain dump of what was on her mind about what needed to be done in this space. And it really did make me weak at the knees. It, it, was, it was just such an overwhelming project that she was thinking about. But the more I thought about it and the more I looked into it and the more I, I read this, this document over and over and the more I realized that we were starting to get these building blocks in place and, um, and that, yeah, maybe we could do this. And um, what she was talking about was establishing a standard of care around carbohydrate reduction. And the very first piece of that um, was to create a set of clinical guidelines for practitioners to be able to use in their practice. And so we set about it. Um, so just to go, the standard of care, by the way, um, this was a legal definition that she actually got from the judge um, when she was on a, on a medical malpractice lawsuit when she was on the jury. And it talks about the standard of care um, is defined as providing healthcare according to the standards of practice among the members of the same healthcare profession with similar training and experience and situated in the same or similar communities. In other words, it does not, it's not what's taught in professional training or from public health policy or even from clinical care guidelines, but rather from what practitioners in a particular community actually do in the provision of care. And um, so we decided we were going to try and work towards establishing that around the low carb community. And so we put a panel of, of advisors together of about 15 of the most amazing people in this space. Um, Professor Tim Noakes, D Gary Fatke, Dave Unwin, people, Nassim uh, Lotra from people from all around the, the world. And Adele did the most incredible job of basically writing these guidelines and then bouncing them off the, the, this panel of 15 um, experts until we got to, to a point where everyone agreed that, that this was a good, at least a generic version of, of, this, um, of these guidelines to go forward. And literally did this in eight months. And during that time, she was prevent defending her PhD thesis. So she actually, just before we published these, she actually became Dr. Adele Hyde. Um, and so we did it in, in May in our event in Seattle. We actually launched um, or published officially these clinical guidelines for medical practitioners. And we, we, we published it on our site and it's, it's great there, but it's not, still not really the right, it's not, it's, it should, it's not its home. It's not where it really belongs. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But now 
One of the great things that, that's happened since then is that it's been translated into a bunch of different languages already. Um, to do both versions of, of Spanish, German, uh, Portuguese, French, and I've actually just got in a, um, a translation for Italian as well, which I haven't actually had a chance to put up on the site yet, but um, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, there's also even maybe a Dutch uh, translation in the works as well, although that guy I think is a bit scared off by the, by the normity of the project. Um, but yeah, so again, all these translations, but not a real home. And so Trocolagian was started writing some stuff on on Twitter that I saw where he was talking about we need to have a, um, a a society or an organization, an umbrella organization or whatever for for this low, for low carb practitioners. And I wrote wrote to him and I said, "Whoa, Tro, I, I mean, I'm already kind of." trying to do that on, on the Low Carb USA site, um, let's get together and talk about how we can do it better and how we can be more effective and, and, and turn this into something useful. And what came out of it was really that we needed to create a new entity. And so we have eventually created something that we're calling the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. And uh, we were really, really hoping to have the um, to have the website up and, and ready to go and everything and actually officially launch it at this event. But I am a software developer by trade, and it, I, stuff is never you're never able to deliver it on time. And so there's still some work to be done to get this done. But hopefully, hopefully in the next month or two, we'll be able to officially uh, launch this thing. And the idea with this is that, first of all, the clinical guidelines are going to migrate over from the Low Carb USA website to this organization and will finally have a real home. And um, the provider database will, will migrate over as well. Uh, the database of papers and articles that we've got on our site, that will migrate over as well so that they'll all have a real home now, and um, new initiatives. So we're going to start a bunch of other committees. Obviously, the Clinical Guidelines Committee that's going to be headed up by Adele will be the first one that, that we establish un, uh, with, within this uh, organization. But one of the other ones, there's a lot of talk about now. Everyone was aware of the USDA guidelines and the, the latest revision that's going to be published, I don't know, very soon. And it's, it's just shocking what, uh, what's actually going to be in those guidelines. And so we feel like we need to focus our efforts now on five years' time. In five years' time, when they do another revision go, we want to actually have a real voice that makes a difference. And I think having an organization that brings all the different low-carb and ketogenic and paleo people together under one umbrella with one focus on eating real food and restricting carbohydrates for better metabolic health. Um, we will have a unified voice, like the vegans have this massive unified voice, and they have such pressure, such clout because of it. We need to be able to compete with that. And we feel like getting enough people into this organization um, is going to give us that voice, and we will establish a committee with, with a, a panel of advisors there as well that will strategize and call on all of you members to, um, to help us with the, uh, with the mission of trying to help change the next revision of the guidelines in, in five years' time. Okay, and so I, the thing that I think is, is most exciting to me is that we're going to establish an accreditation um, program. We're going to define different pathways that, you, uh, that people can, can follow in order to get accredited so that you'll be able to put MHP at the end of your, as a credential at the end of your name if you have met all the criteria to, um, for this accredit or along one of these accreditation pathways. And later today at lunchtime, we actually have a talk from the Nutrition Network um, and they provide a lot of, 
of the training that I was using in, currently um, with the, on, on Low Carb USA. And that, a lot of those courses will, will definitely be included in the, in the different pathways uh, to enable people to get accredited. So if you're interested, I would really encourage you guys to listen to that uh, breakout talk at lunchtime. And, and ask questions as well if you if you have any about uh, about that training because it's 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 pretty incredible what they've been able to establish. Now, if you go the website, this is the, the the URL for the for the website for this new society. But right now, if you go to that pay if you go to that site, it's just got a a data collection form on it. And if you guys are interested, we want to find out who's interested in this, who's going to want to join this once once we launch it, and we're, going to, we're collecting information there about what kind of practice you're in, what your speciality is, what, what your interests are, so that um, you know, we can see who, who we're interesting for now and how we can maybe go after the people that we don't get a lot of interest from, because we want to bring everybody in. We want, it doesn't matter what, what nuances you, you have about how to do the low-carb lifestyle. Um, all that you need to, do, to be a part of this is to understand that it's, it's important to reduce carbs um, and, and all the therapeutic benefits that are involved in that. And exactly how you do that uh, is not important. So hopefully you guys will all go and, and uh, add your names to that so that we can keep you up to date with how it's going, tell you when, it's, when the whole thing is actually launching. And uh, yeah, you know, as we as we define these pathways and stuff like that, we can probably put out um, newsletters and stuff that will that will tell you about that. All right. So um, just quickly, uh, I I was very fortunate to to be invited to be a part of making this movie called Fat Fiction, and um, would really encourage people to to go out. It's it's actually been we were going to. To launch it and was going to be in, in movie theaters and all sorts of stuff, but that COVID happened right at that time. So basically, it just went straight to streaming. And it's actually now available on Amazon Prime. Fat Fiction is the movie to look for. And they do an incredible job of, of addressing this for the layperson. And so, what it's really good for is to be able to show it, like I want to show it to my mom and dad. Um, Pam wants to show it to her mom and dad, maybe to friends that you're bashing your head against the wall and never able to get through to. Those people are the, are the people that, um, that we need to get to with this. All right. So, Fat Fiction. Look it up on, on Amazon Prime. And I, I always finish off my talks on the stage with this. Why are we doing this? I think the story from Pavla says it all. Um, and I stole this, this quote, by the way, from um, Jacob Wilson, who speaks at, 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 at many of our events. And I like it. He always ends off with this. And so I've stolen it from him, and I really like it. And the reason we're doing this is, if not us, then who is going to do this? And if not now, then when? Now is the time, guys. Get involved. Listen to General McRaven. Follow all of those uh, lessons that he gave you in how to make this change the world and uh, this will be a better place for all of us. <laughs>